Евгения. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Maybe just a very quick um, note on the context of the video that we are going to watch. So this is how we started. We were supposed to all be here. I mean, we tried to all be here um, during the presentation of the seminars. We didn't manage, so what we did, we tried to summarize what we are going to do through a video that I believe, or this is what I was told, you couldn't really watch it at the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> So that's also the first time that maybe you are going to, uh, to watch the video, but in the video we really tried to summarize what we are going to do, what, what are like the promises and the aims of this seminar. So we start with the videos and then, as Nader said, um, we are going to yeah, share with you some inputs and then we start the conversation. By the way, my name is Samia Henni and we start yeah, with, uh, with the video. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First of all, we are sorry for not being able to present our seminar in person. We did our best to try to be present, but it was difficult. My name is Samia Henny. I teach history and theory of architecture and urbanism at Cornell University. I write about the various forms of colonial ramifications of architectural histories and theories. I'm the author of Architecture of Counter-Revolution, the French Army in, in Northern Algeria the editor of War Zones and the curator of Discrete Violence, Architecture and the French War in Algiers. I'm delighted to be back with a pedagogical experiment co-teaching the history of modern architecture through colonial, anti-colonial, post-colonial and decolonial practices. I'm sure you're looking at this video and saying, what the hell is this? <laughs> As you can see from the title, of the seminar, there are three prefixes, anti, post, and D, that precedes the term colonial practices. And we are four instructors, Mario Kuten, Po Matsipa, Anurada, Iyer Siddiqui, and myself. So each of us is going to unfold one aspect of these historical and contemporary practices through weekly readings and discussions of specific texts and built environment, each of us is going to examine specific forms of construction or destruction and expose the intrinsic relationship between modernity and different forms of implicit or explicit violence, which are related to human or economic capitals, race and gender. Mario is going to discuss it from an anti-colonial perspective and Paul from a post-colonial one and Anurada from a decolonial perspective. These practices are to be understood together and not separate from one another. We will discuss these intersections on March 29, so please say the date during our common roundtable here at Cooper. I will be introducing and debating with you some specific aspects of special colonial practices. We will understand what is a colonial practice and how did and does it relate to the very form of architectural and planning practices. You will be meeting each instructor three times during this semester. So during my three sessions with you, we will study and discuss the meaning, interpretation and use of the terms colonial, coloniality and colonialism in relation to the built environment. We will analyze key texts that question the legacies of colonial practices and space so I'm very much looking forward to the vibrant discussions and the public roundtable on March 29th. See you very soon. Hi, my name is Mpo Madzipa. I'm a researcher at the Witt School of Architecture and Planning in South Africa. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia's GSAP. I'm really looking forward to the seminar uh, that is experimental with uh, Anu, Samia, and Mario. And for my segment, we'll be exploring post-colonial practices in sub-Saharan Africa. I want to engage with, with post-colonial scholarship on African cities that brings together political economy and space making in Africa. We'll contextualize our understandings of power at multiple scales, from a follicle of hair, the space of the body, the home, the city, and the nation state, and also to think about how these scales are interlinked. We'll take post-colonial studies as an entry point for thinking about power and processes of colonization and imperialism 
that exist in the present, even after the formal dissolution of empire. Rather than a totalizing view of all African cities, what I want to do is take a few key themes and conceptual frameworks that we'll unpack and analyze critically. And in this way, we'll familiarize ourselves with their diversity. In order to make sense of the post-colonial in African cities and its architecture, we will engage with post-colonial urban legacies, urban colonial legacies, and the challenges of neoliberal globalization in the present. The African philosopher Ashiri Mbembe describes the post-colony as not simply a category of time, but rather as a set of relationships and a configuration of events. According to Mbembe, the post-colony is constituted by multiple temporalities that intersect, overlap, and relay one another, an entanglement in which post-colonial regimes of government are not new inventions, but rather the, cum the culmination of several cultures and traditions that have become entangled over time and partake in modernity. So, by the end of the seminar, my hope is that you will be able to understand and analyze the main practices and discourses in African cities critically, and to understand the ways in which colonial orders of knowledge and space making persist in the present not only in sub-Saharan Africa, but in other parts of the world, including the United States. I look forward to meeting you. Hello, my name is Anuradha Siddiqui. I'm a professor at Barnard College at Columbia University. I work in East Africa and South Asia, and I'm writing a book called Architecture of Migration on the history of the Dadaab refugee camps on the border of Somalia. I'm very excited to be with you and my colleagues working together across multiple perspectives with shared concerns. This way of working is at the root of decolonial practice. Decoloniality grows out of anti-colonial struggle. It is not about reversing colonialism. Its goals are to understand how colonialism has informed the production of knowledge, life experience, and the world even after colonial powers have been defeated. As Nelson Maldonado Torres writes, coloniality survives colonialism. It is what Walter Mignolo has called the dark side of modernity. Decoloniality puts colonialism in its place. It is subversive. It's also reparative, restorative, liberatory. It seeks to reverse past and ongoing forms of colonial violence that racialize, erase, denigrate, and objectify people. It aspires to acknowledge and elevate the life, work, and experience of ex-colonized people, presently colonized people, people of color, indigenous people. And it also seeks to restore non-colonial histories and practices shifting epistemic power to the ex-colonized as legitimate points of departure in describing the construction of a modern world order, as Zabele Ndlovugacini writes. Decolonial thinking means that producing knowledge and living it are not separate. It illuminates lines between knowledge, social practices, and action. We'll discuss this in three sessions. The first on knowledge production in the university and the museum, the second on land and architecture, and the third specifically rooted in feminist thought and African life. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Mario Gooden, and I will lead the fourth and final section of our seminar. Uh, I'm an architect based here in New York, and I lead my own practice, Huff and Gooden Architects. I'm the author of Dark Space, Architecture, Representation, and Black Identity, and I also co-direct co the Global Africa Lab at Columbia University, where I'm a professor of practice in the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Our focus uh, in this final section will be specifically upon modernism and modernist architecture. Uh, in Coloniality, the Darker Side of Modernity, author Walter D. Mignolo also states that the Darker Side of Modernity has roots in the Renaissance and the double colonization of time and space. However, the colonization of time and space was not only at the geographical scale of the economic colonization of Africa, the Caribbean, uh, Latin America, and South Asia, for example, 
and the worldview of early ideas of free trade, that is in terms of the human trafficking of African bodies. But this includes the European conception of space that was predicated upon the perspective of an ideal subject best symbolized by Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man and in the mathematical representations of space through the constructed perspective drawing. Not only were these representations from the point of view of the privileged Euro-American subject, but also these representations suppressed the presence of other subjectivities. But like decoloniality, a practice of anti-coloniality does not seek to destroy the colonialism or the idea of modernity. However, neither does it seek a transmodernity as a parallel concept of the cosmopolitan applied to the non-Euro-American world. Rather, our anti-colonial practice in this course will seek to uncover those suppressed subjectivities for which modernity and modern architecture could not have been built. More explicitly, the constructed symbols, institutions, icons, and buildings of, uh, of the modernist movement were built by black labor. Furthermore, black labor, black spatial practices, and black culture continue to be used to maintain the appearance of modernism that assumes the presence of a universal subject that has never been universal nor ideal. As my colleagues uh, have stated, um, we're all looking uh, very forward to working with you this semester and to delving deeper into this discussion. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before maybe I start, um, I would like to thank uh, Nader, Elizabeth, and the team for making this possible, for having us all here. I uh, also want to thank our esteem, my esteemed colleagues for... Hi, everyone. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Now I am the one who speaks, okay? <laughs> That's the other me. <laughs> but, <laughs> So, yes, uh, I really want to thank you uh, all for, um, I mean, the, my colleagues uh, for accepting this challenge because, of course, it's not so, you know, normally uh, uh, seminars are taught by one person. So the fact that we all uh, took this as an opportunity to all teach together and to try to really um, create this seminar collaboratively, as Anu said, it's also part of our at least attempt at decoloniality. Thank you for that. And also the students, thank you so much for taking this uh, as an opportunity and you were not really afraid of, of like, you know, being taught by four completely different people, completely different, um, uh, let's say, approaches, but also backgrounds and even the title was a provocation that we wanted to, yeah, put there on the table and then discuss it today. Thank you for all this, uh, really, I really appreciate this. So I would like to start, maybe Mario, if you could just go to the, please, the, the yeah, it's a very, very short. I would like to start and share with you uh, basic uh, facts that are related to the, to, the, to, the, to the paper or the essay that maybe you all read, at least uh, we circulated, which is called Colonial Ramification. So that's one, yes. So if you go to the second slide, please, and then launch the video, that's it's just about the processes of European colonial power. So this is where we start in the 15th century until today. So it's no sound, yes, yeah, just um, the, the processes. Does it work? Yes? No. You should click yes, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> so no sound. Oh, yeah, I know, no sound. Thank you. <laughs> So, so this is really a fact, you know, in the 15th century, this is how, how European, let's say, power started to colonize the world, uh, and really, we are talking here about the map of the world, so my question, or how, the way that, you know, I started this, uh, um, like thinking of the colonial ramification, but also of the seminar, but also the teaching I'm doing is like, how come that all these territories, all these occupations, all these built environment in the world, as you can see here in this map, are not really part of the histories of architecture that we teach in most of architectural schools. And we are not talking about you know, one or two uh, countries, not one or two, or two uh, societies, but really the majority of the world. So this is really one of, uh, and again, I don't have here you know, uh, uh, responses, but questions that I would like to start with. So this is one, one of, of the questions, if you go to the next slide, sorry that I'm not close to it, so I cannot, next, yes, thank you so much. 
So this is a map that we have to deal with and the ma a map that we, we not only have to deal with, but we need to find a way, and that's what I was trying to say in colonial ramifications. How do you write uh, the histories and theories of these territories, of these environments, of the people, not only the people who colonized, the people who built, but also the people who suffered from, from those uh, processes of colonization? And what I said in the colonial ramification in the text that I shared with you is that, unfortunately, the frame of reference of the vast majority of architectural his histories and theories are very much, very, very much based, uh, like central um, or coming from Euro and North American perspective and also framework. And this is really a question that we are all dealing with. So how do you even uh, decolonize the language, decolonize the way that we look at at these territories, but also the way that research is being done and should be done. You know, in, not in, uh, in some of these territories, the, um, the methodologies of research are very different from what people know, and I think this is also part of what I, I think we should accept and we should be really open, uh, open to it. This is also very important. So here we are talking about the colonization of territories, the colonization of, of societies, and if you go please to the next slide, Mario, thank you very much. We are also <laughs> talking about the displacement, the forced and very, very violent displacement of human beings and human bodies. So from, from in this case, from uh, Africa to North and South America. So this is, if you go again to the next slide, so this is all, again a process. It's a, yeah, I think it should be automatic. This is really a, a, a very long process that, again, we don't really um, uh, include, we don't really acknowledge, and my, role as instructor and researcher and as uh, now a co collaborator of this seminar is really to try to unpack, try to understand and try to really um, uh, uh, advocate for um, a teaching and research that needs to include and normalize these histories within the histories that are being taught. So that's a little bit how I wanted to start, just to really launch, let's say, my position, and then I think Mario, no, Mpo, Mpo, we continue with the post. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Samia, thank you, Nara. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my, my questions around um, architectural education are coming from a location that is very much outside the United States. Uh, my intellectual home is South Africa and I'm very interested in what it means to theorize the world from that place, which I think is a slightly different position to um, integrating it into existing curricula here, which is not to say that um, colonialisms are not very much entrenched in the South African context. Um, I've been very much engaged with the ways in which um, disciplines outside of architecture are thinking about time and place and also ways of dealing with the unknown and also with questions of um, the future. So the text that I signed by Kodja Shun is very much making an argument about uh, thinking about uh, imagination, a, a radical black ima imagination as a chronopolitical act where Africans historically have been people who've understood who have no future and also no history. And so a lot of the imaginative work that is associated with a movement like Afrofuturism, but there are many other traditions on the African continent, are about a reconstruction of African histories um, that, um, that, sub that, that, that subvert these sort of dominant narratives. And what I found um, particularly important in relation to my own um, interests in, in engaging in creative practices within architecture that are located on the African continent um, is really thinking about um, thinking the world from an African location and also thinking the world from a location that is beyond a developmental narrative and that is beyond the kind of humanitarian narrative which are the two sort of brackets through which Africa is often um, Contains. So the argument and the uh, explorations that we've had in our seminar over the last couple of weeks has really been what are the conditions of possibility for a radical imagination of space and what does thinking space from an African location open up in terms of the way we might think about the post-colonial inner city like New York. Thank you for that. Um, 
So um, it's been a very uh, generous uh, set of encounters with the students who've asked surprising questions, um, who've included new vocabularies and new registers for how to read space um, that don't have a lot of a priori assumptions. And I think that this is a very good place to start to think about the limitations of our modes of representation in architecture and how we need to expand the vocabularies that are available to us in order to grapple with the com spatial complexity of so many parts of the world that have not been included in the curriculum so far. So. Right. Um, can I, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So I will just echo the thanks going around the table for um, Nather and Elizabeth for including us and the entire team at Cooper Union for putting this together and my three dear um, intrepid yeah. colleagues who helped to invent this course and these really wonderful students around the table who I think all of us have been um, discussing offline how inspiring it's been to really be in conversation with all of you. Um, so I'm really excited to be in this larger, bringing this kind of conversation into a larger group now. And I wanted to um, help to position a little bit. I said a little bit about, oh, can we go backwards? <laughs> it seems to be For forwarding itself. Can I just go to the beginning of the, yeah, there, this one. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say a few things before going through these slides. Is there a way to stop it? They're auto. I don't know. Oh, they're, they're who's, automatic who's controlling the slide? No one. No one. God is, <laughs> I, 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 God is controlling the slide. Um, it seems to be on some kind of automatic. OK, well, we'll just hopefully it'll loop back around. We can do this. Um, so yeah, maybe stop just, it. I think maybe just stop mm -hmm. it is the way to. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to just um, underscore, I, I, my um, work in this group was to bring a conversation about decoloniality in t to the table and um, the idea of co-authoring a course with three other people and um, having students then be part of that co-authorship and bringing the course into a larger group in real time, I think is a fundamental illustration of decolonial practice. Um, and for that, I'd really like to thank um, my colleagues and the students again. Um, just to sort of further explain what I talked about a bit before, before I'll show you a few um, images to illustrate, but decoloniality is different from decolonization, as I understand it, and I wanted to spell it out a little more clearly um, with a quotation from Nelson Maldonado Torres. Um, he writes, coloniality is different from colonialism. Colonialism denotes a political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests on the power of another nation, which makes such a nation an empire. Coloniality, instead, refers to long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism but that define culture, labor, intersubjectivity relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. <coughs> Thus, coloniality survives colonialism. It's maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of self, and so many other aspects of our modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day. These ideas are a bit of why I think the four of us wanted to take on knowledge production in particular as our project at this table. And we've really seen the students jump into this wholeheartedly. Um, I think that this is a very uh, particularly important project that brings together the concepts and practices of the seminar and the studio into very close entanglement. And um, for that, um, again, I just really thank my colleagues for the many readings that they brought to the table and also the students for their readings of these readings. 
because I think they've shown us a certain kind of practice in the way they've read. Um, I wanted to just quickly, um, if I can ask one of you to move through these slides very quickly, um, just to sort of, because I have had two of my three sessions with the students and I'll have the next one following. And I thought I would just show you um, some slides um, that we opened our conversation with. And I think our conversation opened on March the 1st. Um, really, can we, sorry, do you mind just going back to the first one very quickly? The, I opened by really, we opened by talking about knowledge production and we talked about the university and the museum. Our second session was on land and architecture and next week we'll um, look at a very rooted, specific instance of decolonial um, thinking, um, in really looking at a specific African location in the Dadaab refugee camps, which is where I worked. Um, can we just move to the next slide? Um, you know, I think all of us are really thinking about decolonizing the mind, and if we think about decolonizing the mind and decolonizing architectural history, uh, an important figure to look at in recent history um, is in the next slide, um, Cecil John Rhodes, who has been the focus of um, the Rhodes Must Fall movement, and we talked about this on my, in my first session with the students. This is an image of, um, of a student who in some ways has been credited with starting um, this decolonizing the curriculum movement, the Rhodes Must Fall movement of um, removing a set of statues. What, what I think is very important, can we go to the next slide very quickly, um, is the ways in which architecture and architectural space and architectural figuration um, start to hold a kind of symbolism even in the present moment. Cecil John Rhodes in the next slide, and um, this was in the Guardian article that we shared with you by Amit Choudhury, um, not only left a great income to Oxford University and other colleges in the Rhodes scholarships, but left in his will this rather explicit um, explanation of the ways in which he thought that the British should colonize and subjugate the rest of the world. Um, and I think we've read about this even more clearly in this <coughs> essay by Hegel that Mario gave us. Um, I went on to talk about, can we go to the next slide? Um, my, the university where I work, and a moment in 1968 where students, quote unquote, liberated it, decolonized it. Um, in, the, in the next slide, there, this particular um, moment when Columbia University was occupied, it was occupied by, two, by two different factions that self-segregated white students and black students. This is an image of the black students in the house they took over. They, they did this because they had, um, they shared concerns, but they also had different concerns and they shared the same space in order to um, struggle against the different powers that they felt they needed to. Can we move to the next slide? And I wanted to put this on the table for the students um, at the outset by way of saying that this has had a rather direct effect on architectural history specifically. Um, one of the outcomes of this 1968 movement was to bring in a cohort of African American students into Columbia who were given a tuition free education. Um, they have recently become part of an oral history cohort in an attempt to rewrite architectural history. Um, just the last slide is the last one. And in my own work, I, um, you know, I, I share a concern that Mpo just articulated about telling histories from a very specific African perspective. In my case, I have been working in specific environments of displacement uh, in East Africa. I've been trying very hard to think about um, some of the people who live in these environments, not as subjects of a history, but as narrators of their own history. And this is Isnina Ali Raga, who was elected a chairperson of one of the camps that I worked in. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So good evening, everyone, um, and good evening to the to the students who 
this is actually our first time meeting, <laughs> so hopefully I'll get to uh, uh, introduce myself to each of you individually uh, this evening. I have the pleasure of being the anchor leg of the relay, so to speak, um, and so we will meet for our very first time in, in two weeks. Um, uh, I, what I want to do tonight is actually to unpack a little bit of what I introduced in, in the video and um, where we'll start our, uh, our discussion um, about anti-colonial practices and, and in particular, uh, modernism's desires. Um, in Coloniality, the Darker Side of Modernity, um, author uh, Walter D. Mignolo also states that the Darker Side of Modernity has its roots uh, in the Renaissance and in the double colonization of space and time, which we all know very well you know, through you know, this painting, uh, this Perugino painting of uh, Christ delivering the keys to the kingdom to, to St. Peter. Um, and uh, Mignolo writes, colonization of time was created by the simultaneous invention in the Middle Age and the process of conceptualizing the Renaissance, the colonization of space by the colonization and conquest of the new world. In the colonization of space, modernity encounters its darker side, coloniality. During the time span between 1500 and 2000, three cumulative and not successive faces of modernity are discernible. The first is the Iberian and Catholic face led by Spain and Portugal from 1500 to 1750 approximately. The second, the heart of Europe uh, as described by Hegel, faced by England, France, and Germany at 1750 to 1945. And finally, the US American face led by the United States between 1945 and, and 2000. Since then, a new global order began to unfold, a polycentric world interconnected by the same type of economy. However, this colonization of space and time was not only at the geographical scale of the economic colonization, as I mentioned, um, but also in terms of uh, its epistemology um, or knowledge system that was based upon a particular European uh, centric, Eurocentric point of view. And I'm really intrigued by this, uh, this Portuguese map um, from the 15th century, uh, navigational map, in which you see the edge of the African continent, but how it is triangulated, if you will, um, across the Atlantic, but in relationship to the Iberian Peninsula. So everything sort of being centered around that and brought into this kind of knowledge system and of course, we can't uh, help but to recognize the kind of the mathematical construction that's being overlaid uh, you know, on this, let's say, conceptualization of space in the same way in which the perspective drawing is also a mathematical conception of space. Um, and then we also see this not only in terms of cartography, um, but furthermore in the history of art, representation of, representations of colonial power, and colonial expansion by the painters such as 18th century European masters Baron Lejeune, Antoine Jean Gros, as well as 19th century American painters such as Thomas Cole and David Johnson that are implicitly about the conquering of space and the projection of power through the gaze of an ideal subject. Not only were these representations from the point of view of a privileged Euro-American subject, but also these representations suppressed the presence of other subjectivities. Um, and modernity showed its face in the epistemic assumptions and arguments of Hegel's geographical basis of, of history, which is one of the readings um, which we distributed for this round table and one of the readings that we'll take up in our first session, in which here Hegel presents his theory of the world rooted in the idea uh, that the civilizing process understood through various epochs of history is a rational process that seeks reason, freedom, and self-consciousness which he refers to as man's spirit and existence, elements fundamental to the liberal subject. In addition to outlining various types of history, Hegel, in alignment with the philosophical formation of rational hierarchies in David Hume and the Enlightenment's proto-scientific discourse of natural history and philosophy, conducts a geographical survey of the world and an analysis of cultural and intellectual acuity of each continent's inhabitants. For Hegel, the world is divided into the old world and the new world, and of the various regions and territories he states, and I'll just uh, give you a, a, a couple of these or a few of these, uh, unquote, of America, 
and it's great of civilization, especially in Mexico and Peru, we have formation. But, it's Im but, it, but it imports nothing more uh, that this culture was entirely a, a national one, uh, which must expire as soon as spirit approached it. America has always shown itself physically and psychically powerless, and still shows itself so. For the Aborigines, after the landing of the Europeans in America, gradually vanished at the breath of European activity. In, in the United States of North America, all of the citizens are of European descent, so discounting Native Americans as well as uh, Africans who were brought there as slaves, with whom the old inhabitants could not amalgamate but were driven back. The Aborigines have certainly adopted some arts and usages from the Europeans, amongst others that of brandy drinking, which has operated with deadly effect. Following a lengthy exegesis of the, of the Americas and the capacity for work of Native Americans versus Negroes, indigenous peoples of South America and their susceptibility to colonization through the spirit and agency of, of Catholicism, Hegel states, dismissing then the new world and the dreams to which it may give rise, we pass over the old world, the scene of the world's histories, and must first direct attention to the natural elements and conditions of existence which it presents. He then goes on to look at three distinct regions, the elevated lands, the valley plains, the coastal regions, um, in which uh, he looks at uh, Central Asia, in particular uh, Mongolia, he, say, he states, here we see such a description of a country in the middle Asia inhabited by Mongolians, using the word in a general sense. Uh, from the Caspian Sea towards the Black Sea, as similar tracks may be cited deserts of, uh, in the deserts of Arabia and the Barbary of Africa in South America, the country uh, around the uh, Orinoco and in Paraguay. Uh, the peculiarity of the inhabitants of this elevated region, which is watered somewhat only by rain or by the overflowing of a river, is patriarchal uh, in its life, the division into single families, the region which these families occupy is fruitful or productive. Uh, however, uh, only temporarily. The inhabitants have their property not in land, from which they derive only a trifling profit, but in the animals that wander with them. Uh, for a long time, these fine, uh, for a long time, these fine pastures in the plains, and when they are depastured, the tribe moves to other parts of the country. They are careless and provide nothing for the winter on which account, therefore, half of the herd is frequently cut off. Among these inhabitants of the upland, there exist no legal relations, and consequently, uh, they are exhibited amongst them the extremes of hospitality and repine. Uh, the last more especially when they are surrounded by civilized nations, such as the Arabians, who are assisted in their uh, depredations by the horses and camels. He then moves on to Africa and states, and I'll just read this very, very quickly, uh, Africa proper, as, his, as far as history goes back, has remained for all purposes of connection with the rest of the world shut up. It is the gold land compressed within itself, the land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history is enveloped in the dark mantle of night. Here Hegel says, at this point we leave Africa not to mention it again, for it is of no historical part of the world. It has no movement, no development to exhibit. Historical movement in it is totally absent. So in this, Hegel positions the Negro in counterdistinction, as well as others around the world in, his, in terms of his geographical analysis, in counterdistinction to Europeans, uh, to the white European, and delineates this dichotomy to illustrate that not only do these others, the Negro and others, lack consciousness and therefore subjectivity, but he is also driven by irrational thought processes and inhuman desires. On the other hand, the white European is motivated by rational thought processes, evidenced by organized forms of political and social order, scientific and technological achievements, and the desire for progress. Yet implicit in this paradox uh, of this dialectic is that the Negro is the antithesis of the white European and outside of history, yet the Negro's inferior position, according to Hegel, <coughs> is necessary in order to define the white subject's superiority 
Within this explicit racist analysis, superiority is dependent on a position of inferiority. And by extension and irony, the anterior questions regarding the suppressed subjectivities of architectural discourse and its dark spaces of exclusion are illuminated in given presence. While we recognize the irony in, in this dependency, um, we must also here have a, clear, uh, have a clear case of coloniality as the needed and constitutive dark side of modernity. Uh, hence, this demands what Edward Said defines in, Orient, or in Orientalism Revisited as the need for a contrapuntal reading. It means reading a text within, with an understanding of what is involved when an author shows, for instance, uh, that a colonial sugar plantation is seen as important to the processes of maintaining a particular style of life in England. Moreover, like all literary texts, these are not bounded by their formal historic beginnings and endings. For example, references to Australia and David Copperfield or India and Jane Eyre are made because they can be, because British power, and not just the novelist's fancy, made passing references to these massive appropriations, made these possible. Hence, we must question coloniality at the heart of English literature in the novels of Charlotte Bronte, writing about Victorian England, William Thackeray, oblique references to India and Vanity Fair, for example, and nearly all of the novels of E.M. Foster that spawn romanticized tableaus of Edwardian life, such as Howard's Inn, A Room with a View, and of course, A Passage to India. By extension, we must also conduct a contrapuntal reading, not only of colonial architecture, but also its evolution in terms of modernism with its quote unquote served and servant spaces. For who is at labor in these spaces? Who is at labor in these spaces? What are their spatial practices and cultures, not only as an other, so to speak, but by their own ontological uh, existence? And how are these conditions continued? To, how are these conditions continued to be used to maintain the appearance of modernism that assumes the presence? of a universal subject, again, that was never universal nor ideal. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, yeah, so the way we want to do it is to really like, have a discussion all together, and then we will open it to, to, the, to, to the audience. So if you could start with your questions. <laughs> Ideally. If you don't have questions, I have two million questions to my colleagues. No, but have, I think have, you have many have, questions. We have questions. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, uh, hello, and thank you for uh, putting this course together and having all these professors teach us. Um, if you could just introduce yourselves. I, I'm Cyrus Henry. Uh, I'm a fifth year uh, thesis student in the School of Architecture. Um, and uh, as a class, we were discussing and kind of what, what questions we wanted to, to bring to the table today. And um, thinking of each of your presentations just now in the class sessions that we've had, um, learning about how you each position yourselves with one of these like prefix terms of the anti, post, or decolonial. And uh, so in your presentations, you've articulated the, the differences of these terms. Um, but I think our questions are, kind of uh, how do you see your maybe identity or background as kind of leading you to one of these uh, three positions? And what is, um, what are you problematizing by putting them all together in one course title? And um, extrapolating from that, how are you attempting to develop a model of learning that facilitates uh, this multiplicity of positions or perspectives at once? Thank you. I can start and then just to uh, be, yeah. because it's so, also my fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my fault because I thought, uh, okay, so two, two things, there are not three, there are many. It's, yeah. you know, like there are four. Mm -hmm. The colonial is very, is crucial. So two things maybe I can uh, mention. One is the notion of practice, which I think, again, here I'm not talking on behalf of everyone. I would just now talk 
for myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way I see it, and I think it will be nice to hear really each of us approach and thought. So when I was discussing this with um, Nader, um, we were really discussing about like how, what's the best way of calling it, but with with uh, without uh, like with like yeah, we wanted to to give it a name, but without mm -hmm. categorizing it. You know, it's yeah. not like we are doing only one thing. We wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, to complexify it and to make it very problematic and very, um, yeah, maybe would say maybe complex. So two things for me are very important, colonial and all the prefixes that we have before and practice. So the practice is highly important because it does not um, exclude the theories and histories. It, it has also a, a, a temporal dimension to it. So the practice, it can be also today. So. Even when we talk about colonial or anti or post or decolonial practices, they are can be historical but also contemporary. So things that are happening today, I don't think that we can um, divide the anti, the de, the post. I think this is really um, wrong and very superficial. But um, we propose this because these terms are used very often interchangeably and without any accurate. Uh, understanding of what is, you know, decolonial, you know, everyone is decolonizing, decolonizing art, decolonizing mm -hmm. architecture, everyone wants to decolonize something which is very good. I'm not yeah. saying it's bad, but what does it really mean? You know, what is, de what, how does decoloniality mm -hmm. or decolonialization as, or decolonizing as, as, as an action relate to the post, to the anti, and to the colonial, and I would even add another one, which is the neo-colonial, which, mm -hmm. you know, can be seen in one of those or in yeah. all of those as well. So there are really many takes approaches and I thought, uh, we thought that it would make it a little bit complex and we will not create one category but yeah. give more possibilities to this understanding of the many approaches to these colonial practices. That's my <coughs> response. Cyrus, could you repeat the second part of the question you asked? How do your mm -hmm. backgrounds lead you to one of these positions, and then what was the? Uh, and the second, the second part of the question was um, the kind of model of learning that by having four professors in this range of kind of prefixes for colonial studies, uh, how is that leading towards maybe a, a model of learning that facilitates like having a multiplicity of perspectives simultaneously that doesn't just select one and go with that, but as Sammy is saying, there you can't separate all of them. Shall I go or just mm -hmm. something else? Do you have something immediate ask. to say? <laughs> I, I don't know if I have something immediate to say because I've said a lot of it, but just to <laughs> echo what Samia mentioned. We we can can hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is this better? Uh, um, yes. So first of all, I, I really want to commend Samia for um, imagining this incredibly chaotic situation that, as you can see, is somewhat organized in the end. And I think that what I have really learned a great deal about in hearing the perspectives of these different instructors is that, in fact, there is some benefit to thinking about difference and not aiming mm -hmm. for some sort of conceptual unity, yeah. that in fact there can be different kinds of unity that aren't predicated on what I think many of you in different ways, I mean Mario maybe most explicitly has called a universalism that I think we all associate with um, the formation of the liberal subject and maybe even liberal studies or a, an institution like the Cooper Union, you know. I think there are, um, one thing that I think is very very interesting and unsettling about this approach is that there isn't any attempt to flatten out distinction. That there is, you know, I think as you've all, I mean, at least in my experience, the uh, couple of sessions I've had with all of you, what one of the things I've taken away every night is just thinking about the many different perspectives you each brought to the table. I was thinking of this even just now, um, looking at the ma many maps that were shown and thinking how important it was that um, there was um, 
at least one person, if not two people in the room talking about Japanese colonialism and how Japanese colonialism somehow doesn't ever get its seat at the, t <laughs> at the table and that there are these other many, many um, perspectives that um, I think can both um, be braided into what, um, you know, braided into the themes we're talking about, but also not necessarily um, um, force a homogenizing of those themes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and to, to answer the second part of your question first, I mean, I think that this format of, or this structure is also intended to demonstrate that history is not linear. Um, oftentimes, the way that architectural history is taught is as something which is linear. So we start with, you know, uh, Greece, or we start before Greece, and architectural history ends at 1945, right? So this semester is the Renaissance, the next semester is modernism, what have you. Um, but in this case, um, I think we are thinking about architectural history in terms of time and space as being something which is simultaneous rather than something which is linear and somehow progressive. And I would say that has not only been the model for architectural education, it's actually the kind of general model of European education, right, in terms of that linearity. So to not only recognize the difference, but also to recognize the simultaneity, right. Um, one of the things which uh, this map, one of the maps that I showed was the, a Portuguese navigation map from the 16th century, and it was just kind of amazing all of the places that the Portuguese were were located at the same time, right? So not only the continent of Africa, but in India, as far away as China, South America, you know, playing out different scenarios, you know, of uh, coloniality, if you will. And so I think that's, then when I think about sort of my own sort of background um, to get to the first part of your question, I suppose then what becomes Im important for me was to understand that, and I wasn't not so much interested in problematizing the other, but actually recognizing the other as anterior to some of these conditions. That the presence of the other was, uh, was necessary actually in order to construct these other systems or to construct these knowledge systems. Mm -hmm. And that as a way of, let's say, finding, again, with the questions that I was asking, were who are these uh, subjects that mm -hmm. occupy the servant spaces. In architectural history, they are ubiquitous. Oh, servants served, servants served. It's a kind of cliche. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the occupation of those spaces and the identities of, of these occupants, of these subjectivities? I, um, in, in relation to your question about, you know, where do these positions come from, um, Cyrus, I think that um, for me, my first thinking about architecture happened through literature. So my encounters with Toni Morrison or uh, Chinua Achebe um, are, are authors who are really thinking about, I mean, for Toni Morrison, for instance, thinking about what it means to write from an edge condition. Um, and the kinds of imaginative worlds that it opens up and the vocabularies um, that, 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 that emerge that are not available when one is only operating within a kind of more heteronormative white male understanding of, of literature or, or storytelling mm -hmm. was a really um, radical understanding that, that led to my own thinking about the disciplinary nature and the colonial nature of urban studies, whether one is in the United States or in South Africa. And then the second um, African literary figure is uh, Chinua Achebe, who, who, who writes about the importance of uh, imaginative ruptures, right? So he's writing in a moment when uh, Nigeria is, is Im imagining itself as a post-colonial state, and he's writing in a language that is associated with colonialism and coloniality, and yet he is narrating African stories in new and groundbreaking ways. So I think that a lot of my engagements around these questions of um, writing impossible African subjects in the world comes from an entire generation of African writers and artists who've been doing this for the last 60 years and, and wondering why architectural history and theory is so far behind. Mm 
um, these kinds of imaginative ruptures that have happened in other fields. So there's about an 80 year lag um, between the kinds of creative ruptures that have happened in other fields um, like art and music. Like one could even think about the seminar as a kind of improv jazz ensemble, right? So like <laughs> Samir's on drums, uh, <laughs> Anu's on bass, but, but really sort of a relay of ideas and, and not necessarily prescribing in the sort of with this mathematical precision that Mario mm -hmm. is referring to, but really sort of a jazz in a, an attempt at kind of another kind of theoretical rupture, an inventive rupture, the rethinking uh, discursive platforms, pedag pedagogical models that enable this kind of um, multiplicity. So I think it's, 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 it's something slightly more than identity, but rather modes of being and thinking um, mm -hmm. that intersect and overlap in complicated ways. Next question. Who would like the microphone? <laughs> Grab the mic, Natalia. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Natalia Oliveri. I'm a thesis student as well. Um, so something that has come up for us since the very first session and that we've spoken about um, here and there is the question of the archive. Mm -hmm. And maybe this has to do with the 80 year lag um, because the archive is very much, uh, this institution is, Got it. The institution is very much dependent on the archive and uh, within our own education we respond to sorry you need to speak people, 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 people. Got it. Uh, we respond to this eurocentric and Western model of this archive that is perhaps a violent one uh, but one that provides a sort of legitimacy and longevity to the information <laughs> presented to us um, so what we had been discussing as a group is what form does this new archive, not the archive of the colonizer, but the archive of the colonized take? Um, and how can we begin to preserve this, the memory of the underserved population? Can I? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I think that this idea of, of um, the archive and what it means to work within colonial archives and the narrative it produces is, is really interesting because for me the archive is a space of trauma, right? Uh, if I'm looking for uh, evidence of African history, I'm not necessarily going to find it in the colonial archive and the fact that so much of knowledge production around architecture relies on this colonial archive presupposes that there was nothing that happened before the arrival of this particular way of understanding knowledge. So one of the reasons why I'm so interested in, in literature and art is, is because it, it becomes a way of accessing different modes of storytelling. So there are these cultures of knowledge production that are embedded in the landscape, that are embedded in spatial practices, but that don't necessarily find themselves in to the archive that actually has a very specific temporal bracket. Um, around it. So part of it is also developing new ways of thinking and reading and also recognizing forms of knowledge that might not have been legitimated through these sort of colonial epistemological structures. Um, so, and so this is the rupture, right? So um, art and looking at different kinds of practices. So an artist like Sami Baloji, for instance, has started documenting oral histories that tell territorial histories in the Katanga region. Um, and he recognizes that a preoccupation with Belgian colonial architecture in the Congo will only get him so far in terms of understanding the spatial history of Katanga. Um, and speaking to people who can recite their genealogies over three, four hundred year periods is another way of understanding spatial histories that might have been erased. And I think that that also brings into the question um, the issue of citational genealogies. So who do you actually cite um, when you are constructing an argument? What are the legitimate sources of knowledge outside of these um, constraining structures? And maybe we need to cast on its further and wider and look at other bodies of knowledge, whether it's archaeology or history or anthropology or cultural theory as ways of really understanding the complexities that this very limited vocabulary doesn't allow us to do. But that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's not only a question of, <clears throat> of, let's say, what form does the new archive take, but what is the structure 
right? Because the structure of the archive now is one which uh, separates and defines this is architecture, this is not architecture, this is literature, this is art, this is what have you. So perhaps the, the new structure of the archive is one in which literature exists alongside architecture. Both are perhaps about space and understanding space. Right? So perhaps we have to actually reconstruct a way of organizing the archive in a much more multidisciplinary sort of way, which might also mean reinventing the language for architecture, mm -hmm. such that architecture is becomes less dependent upon its formal representation and begins to engage other modes of representation. Maybe as a follow-up, yeah? Can uh, I? Just, just by, by way of extension, I, I wanted to um, extend this discussion by asking, in, in a moment where our relationship to how we construct facts and uh, notions of truth being up in question, up to question on a daily basis. Part of the way in which uh, history has become institutionalized, down to the way in which somebody gets tenure, is understanding how uh, the archives uh, are distinct, let's say, from secondary sources and uh, and other narratives that revolve around the building of a history. Uh, with primary sources being a kind of the golden mine through which uh, discourse gets channeled. In the context of certain environments where, uh, in a very self-conscious way, certain peoples, certain narratives are erased uh, or in, in some way marginalized, uh, a lot of those, uh, a, lot, a lot of the evidence is also erased as part of it. And so part of that challenge also in my mind is how do you build that evidence? Because it seems like more of a, uh, it, it, it's almost a, a detective's task. How do you uh, give authority to those modalities that would not be accepted by today's standards of uh, authority? <laughs> no, no, go. go I have. I, please, please, after you. Um, is this? Am I? I am I on? Yeah. Um, I I spend a lot of time thinking about this concept of evidence and the objectivity that it purports. Um, you know, I the. When I started on my PhD dissertation research project, I was very interested in understanding um, how, for instance, there could be a, you know, a number of people encamped in a borderland that was so large that from space it looked like a city. Um, and I over the course of my research, I went to visit a number of different places along this border. Um, I, I interviewed probably around 600 people in the end. And I find that um, I'm often asked to talk about, oh, how do you do oral histories? And how do you create an archive of oral histories? And I find that people often want to know, they're, they're most impressed by the number of people whose words have somehow been documented. And I, more and more as I'm developing this work, I find myself really wanting to shift that question away from this being a form of evidence and how this is a form of evidence to what would this narrate? What would this, what kind of a story would this tell in, in, a, in a way in which the numbers, to get back to Mario's um, image of triangulation and the kind of scientific objectivity that it proposes, um, I, I think that those really uh, need to be unsettled as the way that we, we move forward in telling histories. And I think what's most important instead is to really very boldly take in hand fragments 
and the idea that we, we don't have a complete picture, we can't have a complete picture. And by the way, all those Europeans who documented every last thing that everyone did and stuck that in an office and it now lives, you know, in London somewhere, they also didn't have the complete picture of anything. And you can't actually tell, you know, an objective history from these things. I think that the more that um, we lean into the idea that all of these are just narrations, I shouldn't say just narrations, but all of these are narrations, the more that we then um, create authority around different narrative forms. Um, this is in some way underscoring what Mpo just brought up that, and I think that, you know, architecture has a way forward in this. Its way is more complex than literature and art um, because of its multiple entanglements, which you all know very well, but I think um, in some ways leaning into those um, less certain elements is the way um, forward through an archive, in constructing archives, in fact. Yeah, just maybe as a follow-up, I mean, we should really, oh, I mean, yeah, I could start with, you know, what is an archive? I mean, an archive is both the commencement and the commandment, and these are not my words, as you might know. So it's an institution. It's every, every piece of an archive is a construction, as many other things. But just to follow on what Mpo said, that the archive is a space of trauma, I think, or I would maybe advocate and suggest that that trauma, or the, like those spaces of trauma, should be, um, I wouldn't use this term deconstructed, but, but I, I'm thinking of another term, how, how, to, how to frame this. But let's say if we, yeah, I'm thinking of what uh, Anlor, uh, Anlor uh, Stoller said about the colonial archive, how to uh, read the archive against the grain. So the absence of some facts, documents, presence, built environment, uh, the absence of all those things should be taken into account. So the fact that something is absent, if we make it present, if, we, if the, those who are writing these histories uh, problematize the absence of certain histories in the archive. For me, it is already a form of rereading the archive against the grain. So that's also a way of creating evidence or collecting evidence. The fact that the, it's not there, it's already a uh, starting point. It's already a commencement and a commandment. One more thing about um, narration, and I think I I really loved the this Afrofuturism reading, and um, and I also really um, reacted to the Hegel reading, which I hadn't read for a very long time, and I found as I was reading it, it was causing me physical pain in this moment. Um, I took a nap. No, I, really, I, I almost burst into tears just hearing his tone that I think, you know, I hadn't read it. I think I haven't read it since I was in college. And I just, I don't know, it really um, hurt me to hear these words. Um, but I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, in this idea of reading an archive against the grain, again, one of the ways forward, I think, is, um, is thinking toward different modes of narration, like thinking toward a different way of using what you're reading, even in an archive. And I, I, what I loved about this Afrofuturism article is just this idea that you could present something like a fictional future in which a fictional set of scientists or, or archeologists are reading the current moment in their past. But what if that wasn't fiction? Like, what if that is, you know, to this idea of multiple temporalities, what if that isn't a future but is a way to think about 
you know, a future's past. And this notion of futurism is so central to what designers and what architects do. This is such a very important thing to talk about in an architecture school, I think, and how, you know, how future figures into the way you look at anything. I think there is an answer to how to read an archive. What kind of a future can come out of it? And, you know, to that end, you're, I think you're right. It's not so much about destroying the archive or even deconstructing the archive. It's really, in a way, about repurposing, maybe not literally repurposing it, but finding a way to, you know, reinvent a, a story from it. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I've kind of lost my voice. But um, going off of the idea of a future, another question that all of us had was that we've spoken about anti-post decolonialism in the context of higher education institutions, archives, museums. But how, how do these ideas translate into creating policy or built architecture or even deconstructing ideas of what we and the other parts of the world think of as development? And whether that's explicit in the formal language of an architecture or how it functions, um, what are ways of even reading that in projects? Because we just found that it might be there, but we don't really talk about it. And honestly, right now in Design Studio, I have no idea how to bring all of these things that are honestly changing the way I th think about life um, into a studio project, which I, I just don't know how to design outside of a uh, context that we've all always learned. I'm sorry. Nod. Nod, this is for you. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy Instagramming her. <laughs> Perhaps that's your answer. <laughs> well, my introduction essentially tried to prompt this question uh, out of the speakers. Uh, in some ways, I'm looking to Mario uh, to help us understand the degree to which he sees uh, the served and servant space as a metaphor for reading spatiality uh, and certain conceptual platforms into architecture, uh, or whether that's an actuality, and the degree to which we begin to revisit uh, everything about architecture. It's iconographies, uh, it's organizations, even it's abstractions through questions that simply were not posed. And, and so in part I'm looking to this panel to develop conceptual categories that simply weren't part of the canon when we learned history. Uh, and maybe part of that is to understand how the canons were constructed in the first place, as you reread Hegel. Uh, but in reconstructing certain questions, uh, how they begin to implicate form. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is something that maybe Mika Bandini tried to absolve me of it, at the AA some 20, 30 years ago, and that is uh, n not to seek a, a direct connection constantly between ideas and form, to allow for a looser fit, uh, to liberate uh, uh, architecture from uh, that kind of linear reciprocity or instrumentality, to allow, because forms are constantly appropriated uh, and, and many histories are reconstructed in accordance with new agendas that cast onto old forms uh, other ulterior motives as we see every day today. So to some degree, uh, I think what I'm hearing also is that in the Afrofuturism potential is that architecture is projective in its capacity to, to build history uh, as much it is, as, as it is to mine out of it a truth or an, an assumed truth. But I, I don't even think it's just a question of form. I guess that's how I phrased it. But 
organization and structure and an idea of what is permanent and what is architecture in that sense because I mean I'm, I'm stuck more on the idea of what we view as development and how we place policies that then this architecture is built out of and I think that I mean what are the ways of challenging that and changing that Imari, you want to react? I can, I can say a couple of things just to let you a couple of minutes to think how to respond. <laughs> I mean, it's, I agree, I think it's not about, um, first of all, we need a little bit of time. I mean, we, you need time. This is like this semester, of course, you are exposed to such, you know, to, to many ideas, many backgrounds, many approaches, and, and not only ours, but also your colleagues' uh, questions as well. So it's really a lot to take which I think is very important and you need time to digest, to understand and to, to, to use uh, uh, Anu's uh, term of uh, chaos, <laughs> is to, to, to let that chaos um, settle somehow, which I think is very human and important to let it go. But having said that, I think what is very important and you will see it in your own behavior, you will ask questions to people uh, who might say things that are inappropriate. You know, maybe these are your colleagues, maybe these are your critique, your reviewers, your teachers, your uh, relatives, whoever is around you. I think this is also part of this process of understanding why and how things happened and how their forms um, are, are taking place. So I think it's really a matter of time and it will manifest itself. I mean, it will come to you and not the other way around. And I think you are maybe doing it without seeing it this semester. I don't know what's going on, but <laughs> I, I'm sure <laughs> that you are responding to certain, maybe yeah, certain invitations or c certain ways of approaching the brief. Just to interrupt with something yes. uh, that I was thinking about with Taisha's question uh, and Nadir's response to it about kind of maybe absolving this expectation of being able to translate these very uh, big ideas into a form and we might have like a, a tendency to, to have that aspiration. Um, but I think one, uh, to kind of tie in another question that we've all been asking um, is about our, our modes of representation and the conventions that we use in studio and in school and um, kind of as well as shown in Mario's presentation about like the Portuguese maps and the you know very Eurocentric construction of time and space um, the tools that we use in studio are like a direct lineage from those representations so I think part of the the struggle of trying to find a, a reciprocity uh, between those is that we don't really have the language and tools to express those because we're we're using tools that are of a different conception than what we're trying to express. Uh, but but uh, I, I mean, I think there's something in um, the advice that was given to Nader in that maybe there's a looser fit between ideas and form because it seems to me that it's possible that in that gap, right, is the possibility for invention, right? So form, which is something a priori, right? Uh, ideas, which then sort of come from you, but that gap provides a place for then you to work and then for you to find the negotiation. So it seems to me that whereas, let's say, form doesn't necessarily have to follow ideas, perhaps uh, there's not a direct relationship between policy and its outcome. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what happens between, let's say, the making of a policy and then the materialization of that, that policy and how it gets materialized, how it gets translated, uh, perhaps offers some opportunities to experiment in terms of different kinds of materialities. So, I mean, I'm not trying to help you solve your studio project this, <laughs> this term, but I, but I would say maybe allow yourself to, to occupy mm -hmm. that gap, that absence, as a way of giving yourself the freedom, let's say, from the, the, the normative constructions that we expect, or the normative structure that we expect. There are precedents to study. I mean, you, we studied, we read in um, 
one of the sections, this uh, Fred Wilson project, there are forms of institutional critique that have, um, that have form, I and mean, you could use those as precedent. I think, you know, if we go back as far as the, in European tradition, I suppose, the Dadaists, the Surrealists, who are attempting to uh, juxtapose dissonant forms in order to create um, an interruption in the way that three-dimensional space is being rendered. I mean, there are ways to communicate this, but I, I mean, your question really does seem to be about something beyond um, representation and communication. I, your, your question really is revolutionary in a way. You're talking about, you're talking about policy and things that affect people's lives. Like, how do you take uh, the idea of a development project and change it? But I really still have to insist that some of that is is located in pers like the point of view that you privilege. You know, I I have been working on um, the history of a site for you know, 10 years now that one can write this history as a kind of yet another humanitarian project. It can very easily be told this way. It never has to be about a single person. It could really just be about the modern architecture of humanitarianism. And I think that it takes a lot of work, but you can construct other kinds of stories, even within a studio project. And I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. Like you can privilege small moments that do something very different in a studio project than an overall view that is flattening things out. And I think in some ways that's the way to do it. And I think one, like a very practical piece of advice is to start small, like start with a single location or something in the, even if it's a building you're designing, just one little moment that can look a little bit different and suggest something very different about living I think that's maybe getting at what you're getting at. Is that going to change United States aid policy to India? Probably not today, <laughs> but I think that these are the sort of steps. And some of it is like radically changing languages, like lang like how how do you talk about you know how you build in a in a place like this? You will also find that you'll be joined by many voices. I mean, you're, it, you're in a new position and you're in a school and you're studying, but when you start to put these things out in the world, you'll be amazed at, you know, you'll find yourself with fellow travelers sooner than you realize. Is that too optimistic? Somebody slap me. <laughs> Any, any other question? Or uh, we can open it as well to the audience. I think it's a good time to open it to the audience. I, I, I see some fellow faculty right in front <laughs> of me that I <laughs> imagine are filled with questions. <laughs> well, <coughs> it was a complex subject. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I, I was thinking about. Can you give me I was thinking about a series of points that were made, uh, starting from the end, this idea of the, of the what do you do when you want to do a project in the studio. Uh, but also starting from, um, on the other end, this idea of the perspective and, and, and the subject. This because I'm teaching, uh, among other things, uh, architectural history, the Renaissance, all the way to the end of the 17th century. And the I'm sorry? You're the culprit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm also European, so it's like a perfect <laughs> male, uh, aged, also, you know, everything. Uh, and then, uh, and, and um, I had a, set, a series of, of consideration. It's the fact that you know the perspective is obviously a, a project. It's not anything. Uh, uh, it's a cultural project. It's a project of domination, if you want, of uh, what was at the time at least perceived as nature. Uh, but it's but it's a project that it implied the idea of project itself, and it's it's the mathematization of space is implied the fact that 
at that moment, the entire space is mathematized. Uh, it implies also the fact that uh, that space that is not visible can be calculated and can be explored through the map that uh, you presented, but also the future can be calculated. And, and that's where the idea of the project as we think about it comes from. So in relation to that, I'm thinking uh, a little bit of the contemporary situation in which calculability has become what we do all the time. Uh, algorithm uh, uh, are running everything in a sense, right? So in relation to that, the problem of I don't know where to put the line, uh, and I'm very transparent in that, in terms of this decolonizing, not only in terms of geographic things, but also in terms of culture in general, uh, gender and, and so on. Right? Uh, because visibility is absolute part of, of this process that began in the Renaissance, as being pointed out. And so being visible being, means to be inscribed in a process of calculus, so to speak, to be part of, of this matrix that uh, at the beginning was just simply the perspective now is the, 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 the mathematization of everything. Uh, then there is this issue of linearity of history. Um, and I'm thinking about a different kind of synchronicity that has to do with this, uh, with what I just said. So the fact that what started there, it may be reaching a point of fulfillment now. So the, the sim simultaneity is not necessarily uh, uh, something that deals with uh, different things happening in different places, but rather the fact that something that happened a long time ago is actually fully developed now. Uh, and and uh, so this is like a series of association that I made listening to, to, to these things. One thing that interested me in terms of the limited linearity, uh, meaning uh, historical cycles, if you want, rather than a, a long period uh, linearity, is, and what interests me in the Renaissance, that's why I started to look at that, is, is the fact that somehow in the practice of the architect at the time, in the, art, in the span of a couple of centuries, this idea that uh, uh, a language, um, the development of language, the development of the idea of language as a coherent system is a, is a process of repression of what is not containing that language or what is not uh, containable at the moment in that language. And one thing that interests me in terms of, of this issue of the project and how to move uh, inside of a design process outside of certain schemes or certain forms is the fact that if language is treated from the inside as something that can be uh, unfolded in terms of presenting its limits, presenting its contradiction, presenting its own uh, uh, process of repression, meaning liberating in a, or making visible what is repressed, that I think is a practice that doesn't really have an objective uh, as a manifestation of a preconceived idea, but rather has a critical value a, a, to maintaining, if you want, a, crit, a permanent criticality inside of, of, of the practice. So I know this is not a question, uh, obviously, but, but it's a series of association that I had listening to what you were talking. And, you know, it's almost like an analog to the idea of an archive that is built with what is not there, which is, I think, is a, 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 a very, very important idea. Maybe I, I cannot respond to your question, but I can just uh, comment to understand the question or to understand the comment. Is it okay for you? I'm sorry? I, I, I would like to comment on the comment, yes, yes. but I don't have an answer. But, the, the <laughs> <laughs> but let's say the fact that we need to make something visible, it means that it's not there. Yes? You, you were talking about visibility, so you're talking about lin linearity, but also visibility. Yeah, so, yeah. so it means that we do have a, um, let's say, uncontested way of teaching history of architecture. So in order to be, if I follow what you just said, I'm, I'm not sure if I can make sense, but let me try. So 
if we want to be critical, and you said this is, there is no objective, this is part of the criticality of teaching history of architecture. So the fact that we, are, we need to make certain chapters of these histories of architecture visible, it means that they are not there by definition, right? Yeah. If they are not by, there by, I mean, for me this is the biggest problem. So they should be there by definition. They should be normalized. They should be part of the history of architecture. And then we can be critical by not uh, extending the geographies, but by understanding the, 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 the complexities of those juxtapositions of histories that were not there. I mean, this is really a comment. And this is how I'm try I'm, I, I teach, or I try to, to teach. Yes, th thank you, sorry. Hi, thank you guys for having this. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. OK. Hi, my name is Sydney Vernon. Um, I'm a sophomore art student at the Cooper Union. And I really enjoyed what um, info is at home. Yeah, I really enjoyed what you said about um, this panel being like, a jazz ensemble because I've been thinking about that a lot and like uh, encouraging responses, um, like encouraging my own responses to architecture or art holistically. Like, how can I taste this painting? Like, how can I hear this building? And I've been thinking a lot about like, yeah, just those responses. And just from my own research, I was wondering um, if the panel knew of any examples that I could look up of architecture that encourages a response of like that sort. And if you want to respond, please, <laughs> eh? that would be the, yeah. This is really for you, eh? sorry, <laughs> to put you under the spot. I'm just not sure where to start with the research of no, architecture, no. like what what are, where are the cool buildings, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> Hi, um, sorry. I'm David. I'm a third year architecture student. I think the question is really great because I've also been very curious as to how I navigate those questions of like tasting a painting or in some cases I think what does it mean to taste the morning or smell color. Um, and I found myself doing research in nomadic architecture, um, experimental architecture and some uh, precedents that really speak to that is uh, I think Hans Rucker's mind, mind, uh, I think mind bender. Um, and basically a lot of the research that I was doing was uh, based on how one mobilizes architecture. Um, and basically an example of the mind bender, it's more about the uh, sensational experience of the visual or the audio sonically throughout space and how one changes the sensorial effects of the space through this mobile piece of architecture. It's really a study and a precedent um, that really inspired me to think and, and navigate in that direction. Yeah. Hi guys, uh, my name is Daniel Ehrenberg. Uh, I've been practicing for six years. Um, and I run a committee over at the AIA New York. And we just did an event called Future Now, and it was about um, how technology is changing practice. So I think, um, well, thank you, first of all, for opening to the public, because it's really interesting. When you start to practice, you don't get to think about the bigger picture sometimes. Uh, I kind of wanted to steer this in terms of the ideas of archiving um, tools that we have and, and, and how you form architecture, because what comes up in that that's really important today is that we have extreme ac easy access to data. You know, you guys are used to this. There's social media, Google, everything is collecting everything you do, and architecture is now has a piece of that as well, right? So there's a, there's sort of a new tool that's being developed to create a physical response. Um, so so maybe there's a connection there that would be fruitful to your conversation, um, but it, it also raises the question of of the archive because it, it potentially expands the idea of the archive um, and what, what goes in, what kind of data we're tracking, but it also raises the bigger question and this is kind of how we get to what is the new colonial practice and that is how do we curate that data, how do we use that. You know, I think someone gave an example of um, changing, changing their airport design based off of a woman from Des Moines, Iowa walking through the airport. 
well, what the hell is a woman from Des Moines, Iowa, right? We don't, we don't necessarily know, but we have to define that because we're architects and that's what we do. We sort of have to put something physical to some other idea. So I just kind of want to throw that idea out there because I think there's a cross section and we're at a really critical point to, to reframe what the data is that we're using and how we're thinking about it. I have a, I don't know if this is like exactly, um, I guess I'll, I'll talk this way, but I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, so I'm Parker, I'm in thesis, um, and I'm designing a building that is an archive, I guess, of 21 Egyptian obelisks. And so one of the first things that I had to answer in my design is how I would curate them and how I would arrange them. And so what I did was I gave each obelisk a letter and then put them into a letter scrambleizer and then just said that that's the way that they are. And so, and that's, it's something that I was thinking about because I had heard that the way that they pick the seats for the UN conference every year is Brazil has a bucket of uh, spheres and each sphere has a seat number on it and each country will pick a sphere and that determines where they sit for the year. Um, and so it's this, it's like anti-curatorial, it's like supposedly diplomatic, but I think that that's one, it's like a 2019 curation technique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe just to respond, I think, yeah, I think it's really about power relations. So how do you, as an architect, because you do have power as well, but how do you, when do you decide to include or exclude certain uh, ethnic, uh, racial, gender uh, groups. I think this is really something that we do <coughs> almost every day. But also, like, data is technically blind, right? You're just collecting... It is not. That's the... Yeah, in theory. Yeah, okay. You're right. Someone That's has to put value to that, so there's, again, this, this kind of new problem. You know, e yeah, everything we do is made by... I mean, there is a subject behind a computer, a behind any, any kind of technology, and there is this myth that, oh no, technology is objective because, you know, we are collecting data. No, even collecting data is part. I mean, there is always an agenda, but I'm not saying that the agenda is always conscious, you know. I'm, I'm saying that we need to understand where are those data coming from, how they are used, who produced them, what are the purpose of them, who is included, who is not, you know. Who is, I mean, all these questions for me are always, like you don't trust anything and anybody, but you need to also question it and understand what you, you as the person who is making use of all those data, what are you going to do with it, with them? So I think it's not objective, but yes, we are on the same page, thank you. <laughs> Okay, my question is a bit more pragmatic. As you've talked about it, I, I want to suggest a way to expand the archival uh, aspects of all of the world, is maybe we throw out the word indigenous. Now, when a student is doing a thesis, and I, I'm in my 45th year of seeing young architecture students doing creative things, uh, create whole new realms and archival thoughts, if you will, that have, are not based on any particular culture or country. But, but as I sat here, I saw the map of, as the Spanish took over Peru, for example. I've been spending a great deal of time trying to search out, in, if you will, indigenous archives that have not been totally overwhelmed by the Spanish. And up in the mountains, there are a few bits and pieces. But then I've been thinking in Africa, it seems to me like colonization has occurred no African country, except maybe Morocco's relationship with Spain, or maybe there are things that South Africa has done in more recent years. But it seems like it, colonization in Africa has occurred within, that one country has taken over another. And I've been thinking about archivally, what would I, where would I begin to understand the different archives of form and space of African areas? I mean, we know a great deal about Egypt, we know a lot about Morocco, but what about all those countries in the middle of Africa? I, I just don't have any idea where we begin to better understand their archives or what's missing or what's been completely overwhelmed by modern architecture. There may be all kinds of new ways of planning out a community that we should be looking at in the heart of Africa. 
that we never consider in modern design. May I jump in? Um, one of, we read a reading by Elsa Hoover, right? The Standing Rock okay. reading, I believe. Yeah. So one of the readings that um, that uh, we read, I think, um, a couple of weeks ago, was by a young um, indigenous scholar. I'll say her name is Elsa Hoover, and um, she was writing about the Standing Rock resistance and the Standing Rock camps um, uh, from two years ago. Um, and one of the things that she um, brought to light for me that I think is a really important thing to consider is the question of not of how can we know more or how can we see spaces that are hard to see, but the idea that perhaps not all spaces should be accessible to all people. Perhaps not all histories should be made available to us all. That the idea of um, this um, achievable, totalizable knowledge is the same sort of liberal, sect, um, um, liberal secular idea that says that we should also be able to own everything. It's a very imperial idea. I'm not necessarily um, taking this position, but I wanted to put it on the table because I'm actually also curious to understand more about what the students at our table um, get from this this debate, these two positions, and many more positions in between. I mean, I, can I say something? Yeah. I, mean, I think that the question of visibility and invisibility um, can't be divorced from questions of power. So um, sometimes um, things are invisible because people choose to yeah. be invisible, but um, Evelyn Hammonds makes an argument about how uh, it's important to pay attention to silencing structures rather than silences themselves um, in order to understand what is producing certain kinds of visibility or invisibility or silence um, or, or the capacity to articulate. So when we talk about information um, or data that's missing from the archive, the question is what is keeping it out of the archive? Is it that it doesn't exist or that there's something in the frame of reference that makes it impossible for it to be included? So I think that that level of specificity and attention to power and also uh, what Mario was talking about, this kind of repressed subjectivity in architectural history is something that we actually need to call by its name. Right, so so this idea of like this universal white male subject as the figure of rationality that structures um, our understanding, dominant or dominant understandings of knowledge, is something that needs to be named and uh, consistently, right? So that so that the silence is not just sort of like this enigma; it's something that is actively produced by a set of political concerns that are very invested um, in ensuring that certain spaces, certain voices remain invisible. Yeah, I think that, I don't disagree with that. I just think that... Which is different from the choice to, to, to be obscure, to be uh, um, not transparent to right. an external base. I, I so there's different agree. registers. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that there's a great deal of oppression that is keeping certain things silent and power needs to be acknowledged. But I also think that it's worth understanding that the assumption that we should be able to see is, an, is also rooted in power. There are, I think that there are many, um, many people who don't assume that they should have access to all knowledge. That, to me, seems like it's a, an enlightenment-rooted thought. Can I, can I say something? Just this question of archive, I question whether you would recognize one, right? The idea that archives exist in these kinds of cultural norms of expectation and legibility. So there's a slippage between legibility and recognition and access and choice that I think um, as Americans who look at the continent in particular, I question, would you recognize an archive that was produced and developed mm -hmm. in sort of mid-continental conditions? Mm -hmm. Would you recognize it if it was even in front of your face, right? So the idea that, that they don't exist or 
we wonder, I think about Robert Ferris Thompson and the way in which archives, as Mario was talking about earlier, the structure of them are just unrecognizable to most. So um, the idea that uh, you know, the archive is also this hierarchical place where we expect, to, where we expect to things to be legible or it, the, the success in the archive itself is a sort of achievement of legibility, even with the other, I think needs to be questioned. Should I, should I start? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, is really, for me, uh, in general, is not, uh, let's say, particular to the colonial context. I mean, any archive should be questioned, for me. The, in the colonial context, I think one archive is, is not enough. I, I, I think we need a multi multiplicity of voices. I would not call them archives only. I think multiplicity of voices, people who are doing certain kinds of research need to, to, to know at least, at least one of the languages that those people speak, because this is also another problem. Many people do research in places they have no idea about, so the, the idea is not only like the accessibility of the archive, but also the languages that one speaks, but also I think, um, I, I also don't want to, you know, like play the roles of the victim, oh, you know, there are like no, Accessible, no archives, so we cannot do this kind of research. I think even if there are archives or there are no archives, we need to voice certain histories and we need to um, uh, find a way of narrating them. I think that's really part of, of, of the way we need to write. Not only architectural history, I think, but many histories of many people around the world. Uh, I think that the fantastic thing about having this round table in this school is that it is specifically not a historical school, a school about histories that archives are accessed in order to write, but I think it is a visual school uh, where people create. And I think the really importance of the question that Taisha uh, brought about is how to make a project, having all this knowledge about the difficulty in accessing and bringing to light and understanding and seeing archives differently and how to create in a world where so much um, blindness has happened over years. And, um, and I think what Mario said about the where form can be found and it's uh, the discrepancy between form and language and the freedom that one can find. Uh, I think that's really a question of how to make projects, whether in art or architecture. And um, I think um, perhaps this entire project has to be with teaching a way of seeing, because as was said, there's n never a possibility of accessing and knowing and and, and not missing out on, on knowledge. I mean, where, whenever you privilege one, you really Exclude. just like uh, disprivilege the other. And uh, even our way of seeing is so one-sided and one-minded. We just spoke of perspective. I mean, just by using the, you know, perspective is a very specific way of seeing that has the history in itself. And just by using it constantly, we are, not seeing things in a different way. So I think ideally it would be fantastic if any student here could invent a language for each different project, but that would take forever and then we may never find a common language, but that would be the ideal. So I think it's the, the question how to maneuver the set language, especially in a school where uh, the language that we, we need to use a certain language to communicate and that language is not necessarily written, sorry, written, and, and how to still make um, a kind of a mark, but also acknowledging some aspects of, um, um, of those archives and histories that have been um, really marginalized. Mm. And I think, I, I think the, the question that Taisha posed, in, specifically in a school that has a, a, a project and the making of creative spaces is uh, 
really um, the question. And I think it also, I like very much your proposals, and I also think it has to do with perhaps finding new kinds of logics. Uh, I think in uh, science, uh, in technology, technology especially, I think there's so many things that we do not uh, use. You know, I mean, we study still in schools of architecture, we study math, physics, regular math and physics, but when you look at the uh, electrical engineering or neuroscience, there's so many new logics that are fuzzy, that are used to uh, cre create connections that uh, I think um, we need, you know, if we could access that, uh, I think as a way to uh, create new connections, and I think it's been also said to look to the future, you know, because I think that's a, a way to, to access these archives and to connect between archives is really look forward. I, think, I don't know um, if it made sense, but uh, yes. Um, Samia said something earlier which was about the, the rupture, right? And I think in the way that the perspective is a project, the rupture could also be a project, right? You know, the project of rupturing, of, of finding those, those gaps or constructing those gaps or constructing things out of those juxtapositions. So, I mean, I think that could also be the kind of pedagogical tool in terms of education, but it could also be um, uh, the project for an architectural project, for a thesis project, you know, is about you know, the rupture, if you will. Maybe to respond to us, because, but please, if you have any thoughts, I don't want to uh, always, uh, okay, so, okay. <laughs> I think, yes, the students, but also the instructors. I think what we really need as well is um, rethinking the briefs of our studio, of our design studio, so of our, what we ask the students to think, to do, to see, to unpack. So the references that we use, I think, in general are very similar. If you compare <laughs> uh, design studios in, I, won't, I don't want to generalize, but in many, many institutions, architecture schools and departments, the references are very similar, you know, historical references, theoretical references, but also the briefs, you know, everyone has to design like a house, a school, a in this site and so on. So I think another way of thinking, you know, dwelling, exactly another way of thinking it or of trying to do something with it is also to rethink the text of the brief and the references and the assignments to the students. It's a challenge, I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, it's a challenge also for us because this kind of architecture history that I teach, I didn't learn, so I had to invent it as well. Based on many people who are doing a great job, by the way. Sorry. So, um, I want to address this very interesting moment that happened between Professor Siddiqui and uh, Matsipa, where you're really, ta you're talking about opacity and transparency of an archive. Whether an archive should at some point become opaque, um, and the conditions under which that, that should be. Um, and I want to go back to Guido, Guido's constellation of ideas. And one thing that he said, um, he mentioned the linearity of history, not as a simultaneity between multiple locati localities, but a simultaneity between a project that is complete and developing. Uh, I would say that coloniality is that condition in which something is simultaneously complete and developing, in which there is a center that thinks the world is, has been totalized and is developing that project elsewhere and does not recognize other localities. Um, the other thing that Guido said was simultaneous localities, and I think that requires duration. And that's where I'll come back to the, to the archive and opacity, where, um, and actually something that you brought up of erasing indigeneity as a word and that there, there are no archives in Peru. Actually, I would like to select one particular object that could get us to an idea of an archive, and, and that's the quipu, these uh, knotted threads that kept, kept uh, not accounted for populations, but also other ideas. And these objects 
let's say if that's an archive that is not transparent to us, but it's because that the culture that can read that archive has been erased, it's something that should be considered. And through um, duration, through time, that that object and and that the recovering of the kind of imagination that could read that object could lead to a transfer to different localities being simultaneous. In other words, to knowledge all of a sudden being transferred from the from the liberal subject to the to to an encounter of someone else who could know about this, someone somewhere else, and the, um, and. In, in doing that, in that encounter, there's the possibility of a rupture. So that, that's um, my little constellation. <laughs> As I listen to <clears throat> some of these comments, uh, I go back to Cyrus's um, uh, questions about representation and, and Tamar's reflections on, on what Mario was suggesting. And I'm reminded of one of the reasons why I came to the Cooper Union, uh, which I'm now folding into this discussion. And it has to do with a particularity of a history of pedagogy that is rooted in the analysis studio. This is one of those strange moments where, at least at face value, none of the students are asked to do original work in the way that we think that they're doing their own authorship, but rather they're asked to look at history in a strange moment that oscillates between what historians think of diachronic and synchronic history. They're, they're allowed to oscillate between these two because uh, there are ways in which buildings and environments uh, can be seen of as reflections of the social, economic, and political circumstances out of which they emerge, but at the same time, they have the capacity to read in, uh, in terms of their forms and organizations, which can result in new readings that even their authors had maybe not intended in the way that we have read them in, in the books of history. And then there are these moments. There are these moments when a student will invent a way of looking at a building that we all know has existed for centuries but has never been conceptualized this way. And it's in this moment that you realize that the, the archival history of looking back has that projective capacity to build a new form of archive. And I love that moment in our pedagogy more than anything else. So it's not so much a question, but a, a, a really a, a kind of fascinating moment for me in that one moment, precisely because that analytical moment also has that ability to translate into the studios, the other studios. I have one question. Um, there was... Uh, a point made about how architecture was is being left behind uh, in context to things like music and art, um, and so I wonder what can can we can can I can you guys expand on that? Because I wonder what what does it mean to talk about architecture in relationship to mediums that allow for more expressive or creative uh, intuitions to happen? And then my second question is. What, what does it mean to no longer work in a linear fashion in architecture? Um, and how does that become a part of the classroom culture and how do we rethink classroom culture? Because one of the things that I, I think about a lot in reference to is the student-professor relationship and how uh, power dynamics are created or was created in the past. What does that attribute to socially uh, in the classroom, uh, and how is architecture being informed by this vast web of rethinking it um, as we have this discussion now? <laughs> 
to the, the 80 year lag? I, I don't know if I can account for the 80 year lag. I think it's a, it's a question that um, uh, my colleagues and I have um, and are saddened by the fact that we, we need and want models and we have to become our own models um, of the kind of pedagogy and practice that we want to see. It's possible also that because uh, architecture is so embedded in um, capitalist relations uh, and that it to a large extent relies on a client-patron relation that there's less scope for um, certain kinds of experimentation but that also means that the university and the studio become much much more important as sites for invention and um, and disruption. So perhaps the question would be why is it that um, universities and studios have not been able to foment these kinds of questions in the way that other uh, creative practices have, which maybe comes back to some of the questions that Samia was asking, like what are the texts, what are the citational genealogies, what kinds of methodologies does one begin to explore in order to uh, create openings, creative openings um, that bring diverse um, forms of knowledge together and in conversation with each other that might produce new insights. Maybe if I can just, so there are a few thesis students here, um, but something that we had talked about earlier in the year uh, was that in today's world, there is a general mistrust of the architect um, because it is, it has, the architect has become a capitalist figure in society. Um, and we attended a lecture at MoMA a few months ago and it was called to our attention that an architect has not appeared on the cover of Times Magazine in maybe 50 or 60 years. I'm not sure of the exact number. Um, and maybe Cyrus can talk a little bit about this because he's looking at protest. Um, but we had also discussed the role of the architect in protest um, and how in Occupy Wall Street, the architect was not present, whereas there had been a table for every other discipline uh, to come and help or aid the people who were in protest. So I'm not sure where I'm trying to go with this, but go ahead. If I can just add to that, another thing that sort of came up with, in one of our sessions with Anu actually, where we were talking about how she brought up that, we also brought up how architecture students, and specifically, even if we look at the Cooper Union, somehow end up being extremely apolitical and distanced from any kind of movement that is even going on in here. Um, and we were wondering, I mean, I have no answers for something like that, but it's just a question I've had for a long time. What makes us so distant from ever being involved in things that at an institutional level affect us as much as they affect student bodies of the other schools at this institution? Maybe to respond since Natalia mentioned me. Um, <laughs> I, I guess in, in, in my thesis project and what I've been reflecting on and I guess addressing this idea of like an 80 year lag is just um, kind of how, like we were saying, like how embedded in capitalism uh, the current like model for building is and it, one thing that like last year when in uh, construction management I thought it was like so problematic that it's like it, all the money has to come from like one person or institution like it's it's so undemocratic really and all uh, the tools are inaccessible to people not not trained in architecture and I think that it's even just like hearing if you know going to visit an office and all the architects always say oh the clients can never read plan section like we have to you know, it's just the tools are so exclusive in some way and unaccessible and it's, um, I mean, even going back to the question of like, how, how can we like taste a building or, or it's, I don't know if there's gonna be a building out there that says, come taste me. Like, if is that, if is that obvious? But I think it's like just learning a way to, to read the environment in that way and, f and feeling like a certain comfort or accessibility with the, with the tools of architecture and like democratizing 
this practice in a way. I think it's a lot less accessible than uh, a lot of art practices, I would say, and I think that's one reason it's, maybe there's this mistrust uh, of the architect or, um, yeah, this lag and uh, coming up to date with these uh, new ways of thinking. But also, but also, you know, like student demographics, right? Like who gets to study architecture uh, and how representative is, is architecture? And, and that has direct implications for the forms of expression, the language, the things that are considered legitimate avenues of exploration. So I don't see how one arrives at inventiveness in a space of homogeneity. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Khadija. I'm a first year architecture student. So two weeks ago there was a lecture presented uh, called Hidden Architecture. Uh, it was presented by two graduates who sort of went on uh, established a practice to discover um, hidden architecture. <laughs> um, from what I understood, the way that they were presenting it, uh, they were sort of uncovering architecture that was suppressed or architecture that was uh, privileged and therefore over empowering or uh, vo uh, sort of over empowering other um, architecture, uh, works of architecture. Um, and from that, uh, it seems that they didn't, uh, that they didn't uh, sort of see that in order to see that an architecture is hidden, yet there, uh, there has to be an acknowledgement that architecture uh, is sort of uh, revealed so that there is a higher being, a higher power that sort of constrains or uh, limits that. So from that, like they were, and then they said that uh, they sort of developed that the, this hidden architecture was a result of uh, their personal experiences. So there's a power, like a higher power that sort of um, uh, lowers the value of other architecture, what is considered to be architecture. Um, so they developed an archive through social media and through uh, connections and interactions with uh, other people. Um, I was wondering, so should there be a, a way for people to acknowledge that there is people that are privileging other works of architecture over others, and does social media have an a impact over that? Um, yeah. Like, is there a mode or a way to define what an archive is? Like, should be th should there be a certain process that one goes through to sort of to what an archive is? Because they were developing it based off of their personal um, connections, and that may. And they weren't um, uh, sort of schooled in America. They were schooled in, I think it was Portugal or some or where, Spain. Spain. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a different system. So I was wondering, like, like how do you take into account all those other factors? Like, how does one define like archive or? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's. Um, I think there are really many practices um, of architecture that are doing really uh, great work. I think what our discipline allow us to do compared to other disciplines is to see the space or spaces, different kind of spaces, but also to be able to map them. For example, in uh, I mean, I, I my let's say I work on war zones, and in war zones especially when the war is happening, it's not that you know, there's somebody who is archiving everything, especially those who are subjugated to those kinds of violence. But there are many people who are mapping and who are creating those records for others to remember. And they don't have to be necessarily written documents. You know, they can be any kind of documents. I don't want now to list you all kinds of documents, but I think what architects really have as uh, or they are privileged be because they can map, they can draw, they can represent different kinds of spaces. And not only the space that we can see, but also you know, the way that people walk uh, and use the spaces that are not designed for them to be used in that way. You know, like there are really all kinds of levels 
of understanding the city, understanding the built environment, understanding the unbuilt environment, understanding the terrain vague, and understanding really uh, the <coughs> this destroyed and constructed uh, environment. So I think that's that's tool, that instrument, that power that the archi that architects have. So the possibility of drawing, of representing, of understanding spaces should be used in a much more expanded field. Thank you, Samia. As we approach nine o'clock, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> I would normally thank everybody and uh, and uh, really say that how grateful I am for making this event possible as well as the participation you've made uh, uh, possible. But instead, what I'll do is I'll hand the mic over to Elizabeth O'Donnell, who will close out the night for us. <laughs> I think that was a power play. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to call you on it. Um, well, it's an acknowledgement of your It's certainly a pleasure to thank everyone here tonight. Um, and for I think the, the question, many of the questions that were posed, um, if they don't constitute necessarily a rupture at the social or cultural scale, I think we can't take those comments back in this school. So we've heard them. Cyrus, I've heard you actually challenging that potentially the very modes of representation that we use are so fraught with potentially histories of colonialism, privileged ways of seeing, uh, that we have to go pretty far back to basics to say, how can we really take full advantage of this art of architecture, of being able to imagine physical space, how we use it, how we engage it, how it can bring pleasure, how it can bring community how it can also wor work against those things. So how do we, in some ways, stand up and have the courage and make the time to challenge our drawing systems, our historical sequences, our ideas of the environment, um, and uh, essentially to put it all out there and say, what does it mean if potentially We've been doing it all wrong. So I, I think for this group having the courage to say, how do we understand what we do best by imagining, potentially, how we might be doing some of it wrong is really extraordinary. And I would thank everybody at the table for it and um, for everyone who stayed for these, this time to share in it. Uh, so thank you.